we're limiting our segments to light sport aircraft. This does not look like an aircraft. Well, okay. it is an aircraft. It's just not a fixed wing aircraft, but it's not a light sport. Not officially because, well, because FAA just couldn't quite decide to make that decision yeah. yet. These aircraft are all experimental amateur built in the United States. Outside of the United States, they are commonly fully built. In fact, I would guess that's much more the case in Europe and elsewhere than it is kit aircraft. In the United States, it has to be a kit because the FAA never actually took the final step of allowing special light sport aircraft, that is fully built light sport aircraft, for a gyro. Why that so had to do with who ran the rotorcraft directorate back when I'm told, but that matter is something that uh, can be wait can wait for a higher authority. Meanwhile, they are proceeding along very nicely with Watch experimental amateur air can, So how does that work? Twin well, first of all, let's talk just a moment about the price on these aircraft. That's normally where we end up, but it's worth starting out with this here. The one I'm sitting in, which is called the Kalidas, is an eighty-five thousand dollar product. That's that's everything you see here. That's a ready to fly, not, not a ready to fly aircraft, but it's all the parts of the aircraft. It's about an 80 hour kit, I'm told. And I'm also told that uh, if you and your friends show up on a Monday, you can leave on Friday with a complete aircraft. Uh, it's at, at their build center where you're getting some professional advice as well. So you're getting a lot of attention there, but you're also not having to do all that much work. An 80 hour kit measured by any of the airplanes I'm looking out at here at the uh, Sebring Air Show uh, would be a low kit time. So you got a pretty low price, you got a pretty low kit build time even though you have to still build a kit, and you've got a pretty low time needed to be a proficient pilot in it, or at least to get to the point of solo. Uh, point of solo is reached at about 8 to 10 hours I'm told, and about 15 hours you're starting to become pretty comfortable, and at 25 or 30 hours you're becoming quite at one with the machine. How do you get training in the airplane, though, if it can't be licensed in the uh, LSA category? Well, uh, you, they can't charge you for training, but if you buy an aircraft from them, uh, they can give you training at no cost. Uh, that's always been permitted in any experimental aircraft, and that's how a lot of experimental aircraft are learned how to fly, too. So, on the initial takeoff, uh, one of the things you do, it's, it's much like, as Bob describes it to us, it's much like a soft feel landing, where what you want to do is get the wheels up out of the muck if it's a fixed wing airplane. And so stick comes full back, all the way to the full aft position, which I'm presuming also helps uh, get more air going through that rotor, as well as begin to just lighten up the aircraft. The nose will come up, and the nose wheel will come up and uh, you'll be on the mains and then a ground effect action begins to occur even though the, the wing is considerably higher than it is on some other aircraft it's still going to produce that same effect and as it begins to get light you can begin to ease forward on the stick and again ease is the main thing and the word balance comes into the picture here it's a good word because if you think about you know standing on one foot or something you're never doing anything too wild because that'll just tip you right over uh, you just kind of make a lot of gentle, smaller motions, and that seems to be more the ticket than any radical motion with the stick. Not that you're so wild in a fixed-wing aircraft either, because on takeoff you don't want to do a, a heavy motion of the stick, but the effects won't be the same. So, and as you once you once the main wheels, uh, once the rotor gets up just a little bit more speed, you begin to get light in the aircraft, and you lift off. It's not vertical and it doesn't really feel completely vertical, but it feels different because you're developing lift in a different way than a fixed wing does, which is to go through the air more and cause lift to happen that way. Here your wing is already moving faster and uh, as the rotor speed gets up higher and more power is applied, uh, it's more of a lifting sensation even though you are climbing out. It probably looks a lot like a fixed wing to someone observing from the ground. It feels a little different inside the aircraft but not hard. And again, the rudder pedal action is very small. You do have to counteract a P-factor just like you do in a fixed wing aircraft uh, with application of the rudder pedal, but that seems to be less so. The rudder motion seems to be very light and in order to have a what I would call a coordinated turn, you're using much more stick than rudder. Uh, I don't know what the ratio would be, but maybe two or three to one. So what kind of speeds do you have in a, in a gyro then down? Well, uh, this will again depend on uh, propping and how you've got the airplane set up for what kind of performance you normally do with it. In a flight school environment, you might have a flatter pitch prop to carry uh, occupants that are a little heavier or you just want to climb faster or something like that. 
And so this particular aircraft set up the way it is, we were seeing about 85 knots or 85 miles an hour, 85 knots. And uh, in one that is uh, with a little coarser pitch to the prop, you would see about 100 knots. So typical of the light sport airspace, or light sport uh, aircraft uh, sector, you're seeing 100 knot speeds, uh, pretty reasonable. You can travel a long way here. I believe, Bob, you told me you came down here from Maryland to Sebring on three legs, and that was about 850 miles total. So you're flying about three hours, uh, 250, 300 miles, and then you want to take a break and get out of the aircraft and uh, continue on. So really, that's not much different than I would do in many fixed-wing aircraft that I might fly. So on the other hand, if you do lose the engine, it is and of course you've got the rotor going at the speeds it needs to be going at, and you've got a good indicator right here for that, and I imagine you also pick up visual and audible cues that would tell you how fast the rotor is moving. Uh, landing in a, well, for example, I pointed out a baseball field that we saw below us at right, one point and asked Bob if we could land there. I wouldn't, I wouldn't even, I, I would only try that in a fixed wing if it was the only spot available to me, and that still wouldn't be a very happy outcome. In a rotorcraft, I'm guessing you could probably put it down in a baseball field and not think too much about it once you're skilled enough to even attempt such a thing. So, so obviously, training is a necessary thing. But in speaking to another gentleman who's out here, uh, uh, he said, I think you told me about 18 to 20 hours and you were completely comfortable in the aircraft and he's a fixed wing guy like I am. So there's not a long learning cycle to this. There's just a few different sensations to acquire and some differences in how you control. But takeoff, when uh, Bob first spun up the uh, pre-rotator, there's a noise that a fixed wing pilot isn't used to hearing and it's just that uh, power being directed up to the uh, gear the uh, gear that's at the bottom of the base of the rotor disc which spins it up so there's a, an audible sensation there but not any vibration sensation to speak of but there's an extra noise that I wasn't really expecting and on this particular aircraft which was trailer down here you trailer down here correct um, there's some fine-tuning that didn't happen here that would happen if you stayed at your home field. So we had a little bit of motion in the uh, rotor disc, I'll say, uh, that might not be the case if you flew it at home all the time. Those are the kind of things that can get uh, tuned out, for lack of a better word. Uh, so there was a little motion that way. I, I quickly became comfortable with that. I, I really didn't notice it after I first sensed it. And uh, visibility in the aircraft is just, well, you can kind of see from where I'm sitting here. Even with the canopy down over me, it's the visibility is just enormous. With the rotor, with the rotor moving, of course, there's maybe a little sensation of that because it's going at <clears throat> between, well, 250 at the very low end. I think we were seeing about 350 to what 500. Would that be about the range that rotor we? Rotor RPM. Yeah. 350. The most I think we got it up to was about 400. 400. Okay, so it's a fairly narrow band in there. Um, and, and when you pull back on the stick and begin, and you do this gently, as you pull back on the stick, or may, let's take it with a bank turn, for example, where in a fixed wing aircraft, you begin to get a sensation of G-loading because you've got less wing area lifting up. In the case of the rotor aircraft, um, as you pull back on the stick a little bit, the rotor speeds up. It, I, I likened it to a smart rotor. It kind of knows what speed it needs to, or what it needs to do in order to keep producing lift. So instead of increasing angle of attack as you go around in a circle on a fixed wing, the rotor speeds up. And that speed then, I think we're, how much bank? A 45 degree bank or something we may have been at? Or 60. We were at 60, okay. So, and at that, that's when we saw about 400 rotor RPM. And then back down in the normal yeah, range of 350. Off on that tiger strap, white. So we went out and explored uh, turning, um, uh, banking the aircraft, we did a, a simulated engine out uh, where we uh, backed off on the throttle, we didn't shut engine down of course, but we backed off on the throttle, came down. Glide angle's a little shallow I would say, and I suppose that depends on uh, technique and, and other matters as well. Uh, but you can land in such a short area that what to a fixed wing needs to be, can I get to that field or that field, is like, well there's like 18 fields right underneath me I could fit into with this particular aircraft. So the fact that it may not have a 20 to, 20 to 1 glide like some airplanes out here, it doesn't matter because you've got so many more choices of where you can put it down on the ground. Finally, we're coming back into land after doing some of our routines. And oh, another thing that uh, Bob showed me was, let's assume you might be flying into something like a box canyon. A, kind of a fearful thing to do in a fixed wing aircraft because the ability to turn around in a narrow Mark valley is, the is quite limited. Just aircraft. 
in the case of the uh, gyrocopter, uh, you just slow it down a little bit and uh, kick the rudder and you just almost spin around. It felt like I was sitting on a swivel chair. I was in the aft seat and it's like sitting in my office chair and flipping myself around with my legs and just sort of turned right in position. And since I'm right about on CG for the aircraft, uh, that sensation is fairly accurate. So we got done doing these various different trials and uh, pleasant experience. By the way, we flew around low a lot, and I'm told gyrocopter pilots fly around low a lot because, well, you're you're not in the same jeopardy as a fixed wing pilot who wants to be able to have reach to that landing area if things go badly. So you can fly around low. That's fun. You get to sense the environment a lot better. But we finally did all these things. We came back in normal, executed uh, approach to landing patterns. Everything is all the same set up for landing and all. Come down, they said, well, take it down down the runway. Bob added a little bit of power. We flew down the runway just to allow uh, traffic managers to organize things a little better. But then we got to what I'll call the landing, and I kept thinking, well, don't aren't we, we still seem a little high to be flaring. That was my sensation. And uh, we continued to just slow down. Finally, it felt like we just sort of parked in the air and then dropped down. But there's no real dropping sensation because like you don't stall, You've, also, you've got lift going on most of the time here in a different kind of way. So we came up and just sort of parked and stopped and I, I, if we roll 50 feet I'd be surprised. That was just not very far at all. So a very compact landing in the hands of an accomplished pilot like Bob Snyder. Um, I think that might take a little bit of training to get to that skill level but uh, clearly it's not as challenging as one would think. Once we got down we shut down and there's a process again now. There's a there's an instrument or a control on the uh, instrument panel here that says flight or brake. And there is a braking action that can occur. Uh, the, the description is like something like a, brake, a bicycle brake pad that goes up and presses up against the uh, same starter disc that pre-rotates the rotor disc in the first place. And that will begin to slow this uh, overhead blade down so that it's not continuing to do its stuff. And once that's done, I asked Bob, I said, well, it was kind of pointing off to the side, and I figured he could do something about it. And you can use that same thing that starts it up From again to sort of tweak it around in the position until it's dangerous. right ahead of you. Now All you've got an aircraft. extremely narrow aircraft that can be fitted through as well. any kind of an environment. These and then we shut down, got out of the aircraft, and Bob continued to move the aircraft back to uh, his display space here by just pushing on the tail and working the rudder, which is the same thing as working the pedals in the aircraft, and it steers quite precisely back and forth. Uh, so I'm guessing that ground steering is actually quite precise, and you can maneuver using the uh, propeller blast, not the rotor, and move yourself to wherever you need to be on a ramp. A uh, very interesting aircraft in a number of ways that seem strange but isn't so strange, and if you don't overthink it, you'd probably do real well as a fixed wing to gyro pilot. Okay, so Autogyro, the uh, company in Europe, Autogyro USA, the company in the United States importing their product. They've got three aircraft in the fleet. There's the MTO Sport, and that has an average kit price. These are all kits, as I mentioned earlier, of about $70,000. Then there's, the, and the MTO Sport is a uh, tandem seating, open cockpit aircraft. Then there's the Kalidas, that's the one we're in here right now, average kit price of $79,000, and all of them have a similar build time, I'm told. And that one is a tandem seating, as you can see, with a canopy cover over it. And finally, there's a, sort of the top of the line, the Cavalon, which is uh, unusual in the gyro world in that it's a side-by-side -side two-seater. And it's very luxurious, I'm told. has an average kit price of about $110,000. All of these available through Auto Gyro USA. Their website is autogyrousa.com. And on that website, you can find their dealers in other parts of the country. I don't have enough on auto gyros, but I'm going to have more and more as time goes on. You can find that and lots of information about many fixed wing aircraft and the whole fleet of light sport and light kit aircraft on bydanjohnson.com or bydanjohnson.com. Thanks a lot for flying along with us here at Sebring.